Thanks for joining the Christian Perspective channel. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and turn on the notifications bell so you don't miss a thing. Judah was a man in ancient times. Judah was a tribe. Judah is a nation. Judah is also a theology. We get the term we get the modern term Jew from Judah. The Jews are generally speaking the children of the man Judah. There are some um, parts of the Jews that are from other parts of Israel and some that are from Gentile people um, that have joined into the Jewish people. But generally speaking, the majority of Jews are descendants of Judah. And that is why they carry the name of Judah. In episode 14, Jacob the Family Man, we talked a lot about the patriarch Jacob and his two wives and his two concubines and his 12 sons. Now we will look at this chart that we made in episode 14. And is the chart of the sons of Jacob that were made from his two wives and his two concubines. Judah was the fourth son of Jacob from the older sister Leah. And if we see Leah means weary. And remember Leah, what Leah went through was uh, that Jacob loved her, her younger sister more than her, but she married Jacob first. And so she always felt somewhat inadequate before, before her sister, and she was fighting for Jacob's love. Um, and we see this in the names that she gave to her children. The first son is Reuben, that means see a son. And the reason she called him Reuben was the Lord has looked upon my affliction and now my husband will love me. And then the second born son is Simon, which means hearing. The Lord has heard that I was hated and ha has given me this son also. Uh, she's trying to impress Jacob with her bearing of children that makes her better than her sister. And then the third son, Levi, which means attached, which means my husband will be joined to me because I have borne him three sons. And apparently he still loved Rachel more. And then uh, the last son that she bore to Jacob from her own body is uh, Judah, which means celebrated. And it means now I will praise the Lord. Basically, it seems to show that she's forgotten about Jacob and she's saying, I will praise the Lord myself. He has given me four sons. And, um, you know, and, and then when you look down the list, these, these, this list shows the order of the sons in the order they were born. So these were the first four sons of Jacob through the older sister Leah. And we can see the attitudes that were happening in their life, in their daily life, was she was uh, competing for Jacob's love and then gave up on him with Judah. When she bore Judah, she just accepted that she has the Lord's love and she doesn't need Jacob. That's what it seems to show. Um, so that's the, the we, we, we went through this story a lot more in episode 14, but that just shows where Judah fits into this story. In episode 16, part 1, we talked about how Joseph was sold into slavery by his 11 brothers, or 10 brothers, 
because the youngest brother was at home with his father, Joseph's younger brother. But by his ten brothers, he was sold into slavery. And when this was happening, if we look back at Genesis chapter 37, verse um, verse 20, they say, Come, therefore, let us slay him and cast him into a pit, and we will say some evil beast has devoured him, and we will see what becomes of his dreams. Because he had these dreams that he was going to rule over them. And Reuben, the oldest, heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, but cast him in this pit as, that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that, him, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. So Reuben was going to come back later and get him out of the pit. And then they sat down to eat bread, in verse 25, and they, after they cast him into the pit, and they saw a company of Ishmaelites come along, and they were going towards Egypt with their spices and uh, herbs and to trade. And Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it what profit is it to us if we kill our brother and conceal his blood come on let us sell him to the ishmaelites and let not, let not our hand be upon him for he is our brother and our flesh and his brothers were content and there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites. So it sounds like the Midianites came along and found him in the pit before they got back. Because uh, Judah was going to sell them to the Ishmaelites, but the Midianites beat them to it. So Judah said to his brothers, this is kind of it's one of those ironies in the bible because as we said judah is the father of the jews and there's the stereotypical jew the businessman the dealer the 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 treacherous dealer saying what profit is there for us to kill our brother we get nothing out of it and we get blood on our hands it would be better if we sell him and then we'll get money and then we don't have his blood on our hands. So he's a total businessman. So it's kind of ir an irony that he's the father of Jews because of the, uh, the stereotypical Jewish businessman. The first recorded words of Judah in the Bible was about Joseph uh, to sell him rather than kill him. It's better business. Now the next part of the Bible, Genesis chapter 38. Okay, what happened was that they brought Joseph's coat back to their father, Jake, Jacob, and they told him that Joseph was ripped by a wild beast and they found his body and they brought his coat back, or all they found was his bloody coat. And they gave the coat to Jacob and Jacob ripped his clothes and went into mourning for many days. And then it says, and Joseph was sold to Potiphar, the officer of Pharaoh's captain of the guard. And that's the end of chapter 37. Now chapter 38 goes into the life of Judah. So this is after they have sold Joseph and his father is mourning over his brother and he knows what's happening. This has probably ripped their family to pieces because all the sons know what happened. And there's the father in grief. And they all know the brother's not even dead. He was sold to Egypt. So now this is the story of, this is the, the, the backdrop of the story of Judah now. I have made a chart of chapter 38 of Genesis. 
Okay, so if we read Genesis chapter 38, I'll paraphrase the story from the chart here. So Judah, he leaves his fathers and brothers after Jacob is informed of Joseph's death, and he meets an Adulamite. An Adulamite was one of the Canaanite tribes. Um, this Adulamite was named Hira, which means pale. Now, does that mean pale-skinned? I don't know. So this, this Adulamite named Hira was his buddy that he, he hung out with. And from him, through him, he met another Canaanite named Shua. And Shua means cry out, as in crying out for help or crying out in pain. Shua, crying out. And Judah married Shua's daughter. Now, Judah had three children with this daughter. The daughter is never actually named in the Bible. It's, it only calls her the daughter of Shua. So Judah's wife, who is unnamed, bore the first son, and this first son was named Ur, which means awake. And then the second son that she bore was named Onan, which means strong. And the third son was named Shila, which means request. And he was at Chezib when she bare him. So Judah was at Chezib, which means a lie, when she bare him. So Judah took a wife named Tamar for his firstborn son. So he took a wife. It doesn't say what people she was from. I assume she was a Canaanite. But it doesn't really say. But Tamar means palm tree. So what does a palm tree represent in the Bible? A palm tree represents the the cool a palm tree was a a, a a source of shade and there the most common type of palm tree in the middle east is the date palm so it was a, a source of dates also like a very very sweet and rich fruit and shade and the, the what it represents is the life of paradise and righteousness uh, in Psalm chapter, in Psalm 92 verse 12 we read the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree so with the Tamar uh, Judah marries Tamar to his firstborn son Ur but the Lord slew him because he was wicked. Now, why was he wicked? I guess growing up among the Canaanites, he was not learning the ways of his grandfather, probably. So the uh, firstborn son dies. So Judah says to the secondborn son, um, Onan, who means strong, he, Judah says to him, okay, your brother's wife is a widow and she has no child, so you give her a child for your brother. So the way this works is this was one of the principles of Is of, in Israel. This was one of the principles in Israeli law. If you look in the law of Moses, you'll see it there is that if a, if your brother dies and leaves a widow without children, you are obligated, the second next brother down the line is obligated to give that woman a child. And the child is not your like if you're if I'm the, the second brother, I have to give my brother's widow a child. The child is not my child. The child is the brother's child. It's my brother's child. But 
and she will raise it as her husband's child. So this is what was supposed to happen. But Onan spilled his seed on the ground because he knew the seed would not be his. So he uh, didn't want to give his brother a child and he spilled the seed on the ground, but he still did it with her anyway. Uh, and the Lord slew him also because the Lord saw this as wicked. And this here verse, this story of Onan is been used for centuries to go, to say that masturbation is a sin. Because he spilled his seed on the ground, that was considered wicked. And so they tie this with masturbation. And they say, see, if you read this, that proves masturbation is a sin. But they're missing the entire point here. Um, the point is, the, the, it's not the point that he wasted his seed. The point is, if that's the point, that he wasted his seed. If you know anything about reproduction, there's like a million seeds and only one makes it to the egg. So you wasted 900,999 seeds just by making one baby. It's not about wasting seeds. It's about what he did to his brother and what he did to his brother's widow. First of all, he had sex with his brother's widow, which in other in any case would be considered wrong unless he was doing it to give his brother a child. He was he was standing in his brother's place to fulfill the obligation that his brother had towards his wife. Because um, in those days that was an obligation. The, the woman, that was her prize, was to have a child. So she was a widow, and she was expected to live as a widow for the rest of her life. And to be without a child would make it even worse. And she, her husband's gone, and she doesn't even have a child to console her or to carry on his name, and it's a tragedy. So this is to avert the tragedy for his brother. He takes his brother's place to give her a child from the family seed. And this also, in these times, the family all lived together. Uh, she would have been in the, the tent of the family, and she would have been justified. She would have not been a burden to the family. She would be a mother and she would be the mother of the child of the, the, the dead son. That would be a restore her dignity to her. So that's, so that's what it's about. It's not about masturbation and spilling your seeds. Um, that's just medieval theology. It it's really has no, no grounding in scripture. Not in this scripture anyway. Now, so Onan did that, and the Lord slew him because he was wicked too. And then Judah then asked Tamar to remain a widow at her father's house until Shelah grows up because he was afraid that Shelah would also die. He's like, what's with this girl? I've lost two sons already. I'm not going to give her my third son who is too young anyway. So he used it as an excuse. He was thinking, like, these, everyone that touches this girl dies, you know. <laughs> so um, he used that as an excuse to sort of get rid of her. He, he said, why don't you remain a widow at your father's house, and when my third son grows up, I'll call you, and we'll arrange to have you, uh, him give you a child, because this was owed to her. Because the marriage agreement, you see, what Tamar was promised when she married this boy, the oldest son, was that Judah was like a king. 
he walked around like a king. He had a ring, and he had a staff, and he had um, a lot of riches, and he was walking around like he was real somebody, and he had all these uh, promises of Israel. He had uh, uh, he had made a great name for himself, and he was well respected in the community. And sh and he said, if you marry my son, you will be a part of my family, and you will you and your children will inherit these blessings that I have. That that was a, what the deal was for her to marry into the family. So now she's got nothing, and she's a widow, and she can't marry anybody else. So it's Judah's obligation to help her out with giving the next son and the next son as long as until she is, has a son or a daughter or something, right? And uh, so Judah asked her to stay at her father's house and wait until the third son, Sheila, got older. And then uh, Judah's first wife died and Tamar so the unnamed woman, the first wife, she died. It still doesn't name her. And um, Tamar saw that Sheila was grown up, but she still wasn't being called. So she put a veil on and met Judah on the road. She heard he was traveling to this town, and so she put on a veil and waited for him on the road. And he made it. He thought that she was a prostitute. He didn't recognize her. And he made a deal with her uh, for a baby goat, for sex. And she said, well, what do you have to give me uh, as uh, collateral until you come back and give me the goat? Because, and, and he offered his staff and his ring and his bracelets to her. And you hold these until I come back. I'll, I'll give you the goat on the way back. And so she took them. So these are the symbols of his power. His staff is, it's like a, the king's staff. And his ring, um, that was, these are symbols of his authority. He gave them to her. And then uh, he had sex with her and she became pregnant from that. And then Judah uh, came back and sent his servant with a goat to go pay her and to get his staff and ring back, but he couldn't find her. She was gone. And so uh, after three months, Tamar was found to be pregnant. She was a widow living in her father's house, and she was pregnant. And so Judah called for her to be burned. Burn her. Because she's done this. She, she's supposed to not be with any other man for the rest of her life and be a widow and have no child. So Judah wants her to be burned for what she has done. She's pregnant. That's proof that she had sex with somebody. And then she revealed the staff and the jewelry. And she said, the man that owns this staff and this ring and these bracelets is the father of my child. And then Judah acknowledged. He said, she is more righteous than I am because I didn't give her my son, Sheila. So this is pretty deep stuff and it's kind of interesting about Judah and about, we know that Jesus Christ was of the tribe of Judah. So this is uh, the forefather of Jesus Christ is Judah. And the lineage of Christ came through the son of Tamar that was from Judah on his, his son's widow, through his son's widow. And so then Tamar bore twins to Judah and the midwife named them. The midwife, in, for those who don't know, the, mid, the midwife is the woman who helps the pregnant woman when she's in childbirth. So the midwife named them. And they were twins. And the first one, first 
a hand came out and the midwife put a, a, a red thread on his wrist like a bracelet and said this one came out first and then the hand went in and then the one without the bracelet came out first and so she called him Faraz which means a breach or breaking forth and she said how have you broken forth this breach be upon thee so the breach is upon Pharaoh's, he's named as the firstborn, even though Zerah, the secondborn, put his hand out first and got the, the scarlet thread on his arm. And Zerah, the second one, is named Zerah, which means rising light, as the sunrise, you know, just before dawn, there's a light rising. That's Zerah. So, who did the Jesus Christ, who was the, fa the forefather of Jesus Christ? Pharaohs. But there's, this is an interesting thing. Um, Zerah put his arm out first. In Christianity, we have a, 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 a saying, I guess it comes from this verse. There's a scarlet thread. And you'll hear a lot of preachers, Christian preachers, use the same sermon about a scarlet thread running through the Bible. That it's like the, the story of Christ, the, the Messiah, is told right from the beginning and all the way through the scriptures. It's being told over and over and over. It's the scarlet thread. And it's finally been fulfilled when in the, the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So that's the scarlet thread. So the one wearing the scarlet thread is not the actual forefather. The one, the breach, the pharaohs, the second born is actually the forefather of Christ. This is a, it's like a foreshadowing of the Jewish people because these are the children of Judah um, his other sons are all dead Sheila he um, he went on to uh, uh, have sons and daughters but the story of Sheila kind of drops off in, in, in the Bible way in ancient times it's Zerah who is a uh, um, the one, or Pharez, is the one who um, is carries right through to the New Testament, and he's the the for Christians anyway. I'm not sure about Jews, uh, what they think of all this, but uh, to Christian, we're interested in Pharez and Zara because Christ came through Pharez, the breach. And Zerah was his twin brother. So there's, there's two aspects to this. There's, I, I see it like a, uh, the first and second coming of Christ. Okay? So the, the second coming was prophesied before he was born. But he was born first before the second coming. Because uh, as the story goes, Christ was prophesied throughout the Bible and then he was born and he lived a life of 33 years and then he was crucified and died and buried and resurrected and he arose to heaven and he is coming again. So that's the first coming and the second coming. But the Zara putting the second coming, putting his hand out first before the birth of the firstborn and getting the scarlet thread on his wrist, that's like the, the second coming being prophesied. And then he goes back in and then the first then the firstborn is born and then the second. So the, the rising light is the second coming of Christ. The breach is the uh, the physical um, 
body of Christ. Because uh, Christ was a, through Mary, who was also a child of Judah, through Mary, um, Christ was born as a man, and through the Holy Spirit, he was the Son of God, or is the Son of God. So the spiritual came from God, the physical flesh came from Mary. So Pharez represents the flesh, the physical flesh of the man God. God in human form, right? Um, God in the flesh. So the flesh comes through Pharez, and Zara represents the spiritual second coming part of Christ, where he comes back as a living God. Thanks for joining the Christian Perspective channel. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and turn on the notifications bell so you don't miss a thing.